Yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, it says it is. Hi, hello everyone, and welcome to the Risk Taker Dreammaker first live interview with Sherry Galliardi. I am Andrea Kiesling. I'm the co-founder of the Risk Takers Dreammakers Project. And I'm Ann Barwick. I am the owner of A Strong U. I do leadership and personal development coaching. And Andrea and I are the co-founders of Risk Takers Dreammakers, where we love to celebrate passionately purposeful women. Yes. And so this project exists to share the stories of everyday women who are living their dream in hopes of inspiring others to follow their dreams too. And we are so glad that you've joined us tonight to help us celebrate Sherry and learn her story. And since these talks are designed to be very interactive, we hope that you will feel free to light up the chat box um, and let us know where you're watching from. Yeah, let us know what corner of the world you're showing up from and um, give us some hearts and thumbs up. And I always love to hear what kind of weather you're experiencing in your corner <laughs> of the world. What that events from you. Um, yeah, we will have a Q&A at the end. And uh, so if a question pops up in your head during the time, put it in the comments and I'm gonna try and manage those and we'll get those to Sherry in the end. Yes. So I am so excited to introduce our guest, Sherry Galliardi. Sherry, thank you so much for being here and we are gonna turn it over to you to share your story. All right, sounds great. Thank you, I'm honored to be a part of this group and uh, honored to be asked to do this. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. I hope everybody's happy and healthy and staying safe at home. All right, so I'm just gonna share a bit of a story and then there's gonna be plenty of time for questions. Um, but just to give you an idea of how this whole crazy lifestyle of ours, my husband and I, um, how it started. So anyone who knows me knows that I am not prone to emotional outbursts and breakdowns. In the fall of 2010, having been in the same job for 11 years, I found myself alone in my office with the door closed, crying my eyes out. And I was crying ugly, if you know what I mean. I was sobbing, my face was like a pile of goo. My eyes were so red and swollen that I couldn't even hardly see. I had just returned from a meeting to which I had pinned all of my hopes for my future at the university where I worked. And as you could probably guess, it had not gone well. The meeting was a culmination of several months of strategic planning that my program's team had been encouraged to do. We presented our ideal vision to the administrators, the administrators of the purse strings really, and they listened politely, nodded at all the appropriate times, and then swiftly and politely told us, I'm sorry, we're not gonna be able to do this. We tried to see if the door that they were shutting at that moment, that if we could pry it open even just a little bit, just to see if there was any hope on the other side of it. But no, after allowing us to hope and dream and plan, they in no uncertain terms closed and locked the deadbolt. So there I sat in my office with the door closed, making an absolute mess of myself. Now, have you ever reached a point in your life where you're so incredibly busy in your job, but you're not growing personally or professionally anymore? You love your colleagues, but no longer love the job or the work environment. And to be perfectly honest, you simply couldn't deal with the politics or the BS anymore. Have you had colleagues or friends around you get sick or perhaps die? leaving you to wonder, will I ever get to do something really amazing with my life before that's me? These were the thoughts that were running around my head as I was sitting there in my own moment of crisis. I was 41 and I had what everyone around me described as the quote unquote best job on campus, but I simply didn't enjoy it anymore. I was mostly happily married but honestly, my husband and I had kind of become roommates. We were both so busy running crazy lives back and forth to our jobs. I had made the decision that having kids wasn't in the cards for me and I, not something I wanted to put my energy toward. I was working myself to death, not sleeping well and frequently getting sick from it. 
I spent way too much of my free time maintaining a house and yard that I really only used a small fraction of. Folks, I had achieved the American dream and I felt completely trapped by it. This is it? This is it? Is what I kept asking myself. The energy and time it took to keep this dream alive, this quote unquote dream alive, was not at all sustainable for me. And you've probably guessed it, this was the perfect recipe for the beginning of a midlife crisis. Through those tears, something came over me. It felt much stronger than relief. It was it, basically, it was liberation. I stood up, I wiped my eyes, I opened my office door and it was like a dark veil lifted. I realized I was no longer responsible for the direction that my program took. I was free. And if I was free, I could dream. I dreamed of a different life, a life where someday I'd have the chance to really explore our national parks. Someday I wanted to live more in balance with nature and live more sustainably and lessen my carbon footprint. Someday I will have the time to do more volunteer work. Someday I'll be able to spend more time outside rather than in an office. Someday I'll join the Peace Corps. Someday, someday, someday. So who else has dreamed of someday? Has anybody out there dreamed of someday before? I'm sure you have. These daydreams, these wishes, these procrastinations are useful to help us through a rough spot in our life, a rough, rough spot in our present situation. Maybe like right now, if you're dealing with a rough spot as a result of this pandemic. But they can also be a trap that holds you in a place that you just don't need to be anymore. So I just, I love this quote and I wanna share it with you. And that is, consider these words um, by author and life coach, Tim Timothy Ferris. So here's his quote. For all the most important things, the timing always sucks, just sucks. Conditions are never perfect. Someday is a disease that, you, that will take your dreams to the grave with you. If it's important to you and you wanna do it eventually, then just do it and correct course along the way. Now I had not seen that quote before I had started this, but it resonated immediately when I saw it. But let me take you back a few months before that fateful meeting. It was the day that the seeds of an escape plan had kind of took root a little bit, had taken root. Well, on a bike ride along the lovely new river near our former home, I pitched my idea to my husband. I said, hey, babe, why don't we rent out the house, buy a camper, travel the country for about a year, year and a half, and then join the Peace Corps? He immediately said, I love it. Let's do it. But little did I realize that he was still thinking, let's do it someday. Now we're a bit different when it comes to acting on our dreams. When he voices something, it may be the first time he's actually ever thought about it. He wants to hear how it sounds outside of his head. He wants to bounce the idea off of other people. He wants to just kind of check it out. Me on the other hand, when I say something, I've been thinking about it for a long time. I've been mulling it over testing out my own head. And when the words actually leave my lips, watch out, I am ready to act. So when I opened the door to my office, I was beyond ready. I went home, I poured myself a glass of wine. I'm sure it was Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> I popped open the laptop and I went back to the page where we had been perusing some campers on eBay. And before my eyes was the perfect vehicle to achieve our someday dreams. Something just came over me. I felt empowered to just go for it. And I submitted an impromptu bed. And I had never in my life or even since purchased anything on eBay. So I did all this before my husband came home. And when I heard his car come into the driveway from work, I thought, well, 
this is it. And so I met him at the door and before his body even broke the plane of the door, I said to him, promise me you won't be mad. And he said, what have you done? And I said, no, you have to promise, promise me you won't be mad. He's like, you have to tell me what you've done. And I said, well, you know those campers that we have been looking at on eBay? He said, yeah. I said, well, I, I put a bid on one and I'm pretty certain that I'm gonna win. So my husband likes to tease me that the purchase of the camper said to him in no uncertain words, I'm leaving and you're invited. About three hours later, we won that bid. And that life changing moment led to 18 months of insane activity, including bringing new life to a beat up old hunting trailer that I had just purchased and downsizing our life from two careers, two cars, a three bedroom, two and a half bath house to one truck loaded with outdoor gear and a 72 square foot vintage camper without a bathroom. So we launched our new life on our 12th wedding anniversary, kind of as a gift to our marriage. And over the last seven and a half years, we have been to all 50 states except Alaska, but don't worry, it's still on our list. It's just kind of a long way away and it's a vintage camper. So we have to be, we have to figure out how we're gonna do that. We've been to eight Canadian provinces. We've been to three developing countries to do volunteer work. And we have been to more national parks and wilderness areas than we can possibly count. But it is impossible to just quantify the impact of this lifestyle. We have learned enough about this land to fill a library, but we feel like we kind of barely scratched the surface. We have pushed our limits and challenged absolutely everything that we've taken for granted in the past, but we haven't looked back, wishing that we could return, not even once. While our annual schedule has evolved over time, we typically spend about four months doing volunteer work, four months working for pay, and four months doing some sort of adventure travel. It's been different every single year. Nothing has ever been the same or routine for us. And I learned something about myself. I learned that I thrive on change rather than on routine. We've had a wide variety of opportunities to do paid work, some really interesting volunteer experiences and some truly incredible adventures. And if there's anything that I have learned over the past seven and a half years is that when one door shuts, shuts just closed in your face, there's another door with something different, a new opportunity waiting for you on the other side. And we've been asked by many people when this crazy road trip of ours will ever end. And we almost always answer with the exact same phrase. And that is, when it isn't fun anymore. So that's my story. And now I would love to take some questions. Yeah, Sherry, well, thank you for sharing that with us. You know, I'm sure that um, there are a lot of questions that come up, you know, during that story and we can all resonate on some level with this someday concept, you know, um, the idea of we want to pursue our dream or there's something out there that we want to do someday. So what an incredible inspiration of actually putting that day on the calendar. That's amazing. I do want to ask you though, you know, when whenever you talk about putting this day on the calendar, you know, you purchased Hamlet, uh, you move forward with those kinds of things. Were there any kind of fears that were coming up for you or for your husband um, before you actually took the leap, took the leap and, you know, just jumped, jumped off into this and rolled out of town? <laughs> sure. Um, they're very different, amazingly enough. And um, I wasn't actually all that concerned about money. I wasn't that concerned about losing community or anything like that. Those were big fears for him. And um, I can't explain why, except for that it just felt so right at the time. It felt like an absolute natural next step 
we had been planning at that point for it for about 18 months. Um, and we had probably been saving at that point for six years um, prior to just saving for something. We didn't know what that something was going to look like. It was the something, it was the bank account for someday, not a rainy day, but the someday. And um, so we felt very, very ready about that. Um, so the, the fears were, they were, for me, it was kind of small fears. It was little, it was little hurdles. So, um, you know, telling, I think probably telling my supervisor and telling our friends, that was probably the hardest part and the most fearful part. Well, once it was out there, it was a small enough community that I lived in that as I imagined, and I kind of thought this was gonna happen, everybody knew before I could even get to people to let them know what, what we were gonna do. And we kind of had to keep it somewhat on the down low as we were um, preparing just because we were afraid it was spread too fast. So I was kind of fearful of that. And, um, but yeah, I, I mean, we went into this, this was before like van life was a thing. We didn't know a single person that lived in an RV except for like retirees. Um, I guess I was, I mean, a little bit worried that the money would run out or something, but I just, I just knew that we could stop and we could work and we could find something. Um, and I really never gave it a second thought to go, going back to the job that I had. It was like that door was closed and I was, it was ready, you know, ready to move on. Um, my husband also um, admitted to the fact that he was scared to death of where we were gonna park for the night, you know? And I, and I, I said, well, campgrounds and, and, and places like that and friends' houses and, you know, he hadn't really thought that aspect of it through, but honestly, we haven't had a single solitary problem with it. And um, we've been welcomed in a lot of neighborhoods and a lot of places. And, um, and we've learned a ton about how to live on the road. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely amazing, so. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thanks for asking that question. And along the same lines of fears that were involved, you know, as the risk takers, dream makers, we talk a lot about taking the risks. And sometimes we just have to kind of take the leap of faith um, into whatever it is that we determine or define as our dream. And we talked a little bit that, about this off camera and you talked about the risk that were involved. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about um, the risks that you that you kind of outlined in not doing something like this. Oh, the risks of not doing something like this. Well, um, I think I told you that my, I was just wondering, is this it? for my life? Is this all that I was, you know, and I, I thought about a different job, you know, or a similar job at a different university. And I thought it's the same politics. It's the same BS that I just don't want to deal with. Um, I loved the community I lived in and all of that, but I just, I just wasn't growing anymore. I wasn't growing professionally. I wasn't growing personally. I felt completely not just stuck in a rut. I felt trapped. I felt completely trapped by the life that we had created for ourselves. And it, it there was no way, it, nothing was changing. Like we kept trying to change things and nothing was changing. And it just, it felt like it was spinning out of control. And um, it was affecting my health. And I don't know, that was a risk, I guess, just to, if it continued to affect my health and my well-being and my sleep and all of that, I, I love to sleep. So when I don't get sleep, that's a big deal. It's a risky, yeah. It's a real big deal for me. Um, I, for the parents out there of young ones, I don't know how you do it. So <laughs> I, I need to sleep, but anyway, so yeah, I think, I think those risks of just staying put um, I actually have a great quote that is along these lines that I'd like to share if I could. And it is, um, change is hard because people often overestimate the value of what they have and underestimate the value of what they may gain by giving that up. Hmm. And that's actually a quote that, you know, my husband was more nervous than I was come, you know, our launch date um, and about a month before our launch date, this quote just like dropped into his life somewhere mm -hmm. and he has no idea where it came from. He has no idea if it came on email or somebody purposely, you know, sent it to him or put it on his desk, but he remembers the quote. Mm -hmm. And it's actually from um, a 1994 book, The Flight of the Buffalo. So the quote is from James Belasco and Ralph Stair. 
Mm. But it resonates all the time. Many, many people are afraid of change, but I think if I'd stuck with it, what I was doing, that I, would have been the risk. It would have been the risk. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, I know that we've got several questions coming in. So Anne, um, could you tell us some questions so Sherry can answer those? Yeah, sure. Let's see. Um, we've got a lot of cool. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. Okay. Awesome. Um, We've got some cool questions here. Um, first of all, you've got a lot of shout outs, Sherry. You got a lot of big <laughs> followers here. Awesome. Um, Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, Brittany McGarry says, you can't see me, but I'm jumping up and down because I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. Uh, we got Crystal from Carlisle, Ohio. Uh, hello, hello, hello. And um, let me get, we've got some questions here. So, okay. First question here is um, from Z Wood. And um, he says, have you two written up a how-to guide for preparing? <laughs> We, we haven't written a book, but we do a lot of blogging. It's actually one of the things that helps kind of keep us on the road. And um, so we blog for different organizations. We've done a lot of writing about preparing for life on the road and things like that, and just some tips and advice and such, but, but not a book in that regard. And we are working on another book, but it's more of a memoir, um, less of a how-to, um, just because there are a lot of how-to things out there, but yeah. So cool. Okay. And those are all available via our website or people can contact me personally if they can't find what they're looking for. And I'm happy to point them in the direction of a blog that I wrote. So, or one of us wrote. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, we will add for sure at the end of the comments, um, some ways they can get in touch with you and the places they can follow your blog. Sure. Uh, let's see. Brittany had a question. Let me see if I can find that. Oh, well, here's one from Crystal Ford Bingle. She says, what has it been like with the current COVID-19 situation? Like, are, are you currently um, in the volunteer months? So uh, that's an excellent question. Good question, Crystal. Okay, so I'll tell you what kind of what happened when all of this came down. Um, we had just arrived, we had started, uh, one of the ways we've kept on the road, let me back up, was um, we'd started this 2020 road show and we were going around to college campuses and public libraries and outdoor outfitters and we were doing open houses of Hamlet and we were doing presentations um, similar to this, but a, a bit different. And um, on March 11th, we were in Boone North, Boone, North Carolina because we were gonna be presenting at Appalachian State and then we were gonna be going further into North Carolina and then down to Georgia and up to Virginia and everything came came to a screeching halt. And um, so the last thing we wanted was anybody inside of our house <laughs> during an open house. And we are equipped to completely boondock. So we headed into the national forest and we um, set up camp and our tour, that the tour link that I provided for you ladies earlier today, that is taken from that spot in the woods. So that's, that's what we've been doing for about a month and we were hiking and we were paddling and the trails were open and such and there was nobody around. So we were thoroughly enjoying the national forest. So it really didn't affect us that much. Um, we had more anxiety going into the grocery store than we did with anything else. But we were in a pretty rural town um, that really hadn't been drastically affected by the virus, at least at that point. Um, I'm sure things have changed a little bit. And while we were there, you know, we couldn't really come in contact with anybody, but we noticed that the national forest had a lot of trash in it. And so pretty much every day, every other day, we were out picking up as much trash as we possibly could um, to clean the place up. And so that was, that was something that we just felt like we could do at that time. Um, since then, we've been talking about what else we can do. And we just got in talk, contact with um, a local farm um, in North Carolina that um, has said, you know, we're practicing the whole social distancing thing, but it's a farm and this is growing season and we could absolutely use your help. And we have actually wolfed on farms all across the nation. And we actually have done some agricultural work in Africa as well. So I've got a good background in that and um, feel comfortable with kind of whatever projects they throw at us. And we're not looking for money. Um, we were just were looking for something 
positive to do during this time. And um, we thought giving some of our skills and experience to a farm that might need it, that may not have volunteers. And because we come with our own home, we don't have to be in their home. We just need water, basically. Um, maybe some Wi-Fi would be helpful so we can continue on with our digital nomad work that we do on the road. So, so that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Jerry, could you talk, could you talk a little bit more about, you know, you said you kind of segment your, your um, life on the road in terms of a year in three parts, the service, the, the volunteer, well, that is service. Um, and, you know, how do you find those types of service opportunities so that you can, you know, continue to plug in and, and do all the kinds of amazing service that you guys are doing? How do you find that? <laughs> Sure, um, in a variety of ways. Sometimes people tell us about it and we just follow through on things. Um, I was the director of service learning, so I am pretty well connected and kind of know where to look. <clears throat> but we've also done um, quite a bit of work with the federal government through volunteer.gov. And that'll get you connected to the national parks or anything really run by the uh, federal government. So the Forest Service, BLM, which is Bureau of Land Management, all of that. And they list their volunteer opportunities on volunteer.gov. And you can actually sort through them by if you have an RV and you're bringing an RV with you um, as to which ones have spots available for RVs. And so we've looked through those and we've done that. We've volunteered in Washington at the North Cascades National Park. We've volunteered in Maine at Acadia National Park. And one thing that we did to kind of help with that. I mean, you can you can volunteer in so many different ways for the national parks, anything from working in the visitor centers to doing maintenance and campground hosts, but we wanted to use our education background. And um, since we left our jobs at the university, we've actually gotten a certificate in environmental education through the state of North mm -hmm. Carolina. And that was something that took a couple of years. It was a 200 hour program. It was so much fun to do. We, we had a blast uh, earning the certificate. And then we've been able to use that additional education to um, serve our national park. So that's one example. Um, but others have kind of just fallen in our lap or we've just sought out what we were looking for at that time, so. Great. Yeah. Awesome. I, I have a few other questions from our viewers. Great. This is really interesting. So thank you, Sherry, for just opening up your world to us. Yeah. It's um, a little different, I realize that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating, it's fascinating. So, um, Brittany wanted to know, is there anything about your life before the open road that you sometimes miss? <laughs> As you can imagine, we've been asked that numerous times. That is, that is definitely something. And um, I think we actually both agree on this response. Um, not, not that it matters. He's not here right now. But uh, we both, we used to have pets. We used to have cats and we love animals, just absolutely love them. And well, we have seen people successfully travel with pets. Our camper is pretty small and I have no idea where I'd put a litter box for a cat <laughs> or, or what, how I would handle a dog in here. Also, there have been plenty of times that we have left Hamlet behind and gone on some backcountry adventures for anywhere from one to three weeks. And I don't know what I would do with that pet during that time. It would be really kind of unfair for the pet. So. I miss pets, but the way I get those into my life is either um, visit friends with pets and I'm, I'm the first person down on the floor loving all over them and um, letting them in my lap and picking them up and, and all that. All my friends that I visited, they know what I'm talking about. I usually am completely covered in hair by the time um, I leave there. And, um, or visit an SBCA or Humane Society, you know, and spend some time, you know, walk a dog or sit in the cat room and, and things like that is definitely a possibility to, to get that pet love. Um, and the other uh, thing that I miss that um, I'm almost embarrassed to admit is we had a hot tub on our back deck. And um, <laughs> that is really the only other thing that I miss is after a big long hike or bike ride and I've got sore muscles I would love to hop in that hot tub, but you know, it's just, it's not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it just for that. So, but that's about it. I really don't miss anything else. So <laughs> pets and a hot tub. Well, I'm glad to hear you're getting your pet therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and we go to hot springs. So if we, we, when we're out West and there's plenty of hot springs to go into, we'll do that. But it's not like 
we can just do that any day we want. So yeah, well, good. I'm glad you're getting in a little bit of the hot tub. I mean, gosh, what? Springs, what yeah. Hot springs. That's a great yeah. hot tub. Or, I guess actually, I should say too. There's been a couple of times um, we've been in areas that have a really nice rec center, and you can get a day pass. And so we'll go in and swim in the pool, or soak in their hot tub, or go in their sauna. So we have done that occasionally as well. That's cool. And at least they're cleaning it out for you, right? <laughs> yes, they are. Yes, they are. And they paid for it too. It's great. And I paid $7 to use it. <laughs> so. That sounds like a good, a good uh, deal then. It's a good deal. Okay. We have, let's see, another question of, um, oh, what's the biggest risk you and Hutch have taken while on the road? Brittany says, I know there's a story there. <laughs> <laughs> let's see here. Biggest risk that I have taken. <sighs> it's hard to throw that into the category of biggest, I would imagine, because it's what's big to some people isn't to others. <clears throat> but I can tell you about some times that I've taken a personal risk based on some fears that I've had in the natural environment that have really challenged me and pushed me further. Um, and has opened up a whole new world of opportunity. So this is just something that immediately popped in my mind, but I, since I was a child, I had a well ingrained, what I call super fear of water. And this was water I couldn't see the bottom of. So I swim in a pool, no problem, hot tub, no problem. But if it involved an ocean or a river or anything I couldn't see the bottom of, forget it, I wasn't gonna get in it. I wouldn't even hardly get near it, maybe up to my knees. Mm -hmm. That's about it. And paddling a kayak has been a huge part of the last seven and a half years. And my husband happens to be an instructor. He's very patient and all of that. But I have continued to tackle this fear over and over and over again um, on rivers, on the ocean, on lakes, you know, ev everywhere. And it, it continues to bubble up for me. And you know, that fear, when you've got a deeply ingrained fear, it just never goes away. It's always there and something will bring it up again. And so you have to kind of settle it back down. But um, I mean, I had a fear of walking over kind of spindly bridges over water. I mean, it was, I, yeah, I've got pictures of me like challenging myself to, it sounds like no big deal to some people and to others, it's just like, oh, no way. I've learned to scuba dive. Um, I actually spent my entire last two summers working as a naturalist guide on a tour boat um, in the Gulf of Maine. So I would spend probably six hours a day on that boat doing environmental education and interpretation. So I've come far enough with my fear that I was willing to do that kind of work and it was a blast. And, it, and by tackling that fear and really just like engaging with it, it's taken me to some phenomenal places I never, ever, ever would have had a chance to go to. Mm. That's a great testimony of how <laughs> fears can hold us back, but once we can push through them, yep. all the adventures and wonderful experiences that we can have. Yeah, doing yep. that. absolutely, absolutely. And I, was, I wanted to tackle the fear, but when it's a fear that's that well ingrained, it is so hard to overcome that. You know, it's, easy, it's just easier to say, I don't want to, and just back away and, and, and not engage with it and not tell anybody why, <laughs> you know, it's, but it's, yeah. So it's something I'm pretty proud of. I, like I said, it was still, the fear is still there, but I keep working on it and it's been, it's been great. So. Yeah. It sounds like you've exposed that fear. So that's. I have, I have exposed it well. <laughs> yeah. So Amy has a couple questions, Sherry. Okay. Great. Um, she says, you're such an inspiration. Oh, she said, best advice for relationship with someone you're sharing such constant close proximity to. <laughs> and then our second question on that would be, what's your favorite thing to eat while on the road over a campfire? Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, first, those are two very different questions. So uh, first of all, um, you know, Hutch and I never fight. I'm kidding. Like we fight. <laughs> we argue about things, but I, I think just learning, I, I'm not a patient person. Uh, my story probably alludes to that a little bit. I'm not a patient person, but I have learned a tremendous amount of patience with myself as well as with my partner. 
Um, also, I like to remind people that while we do sleep and cook and eat occasionally inside of 72 square feet, we also spend a lot of time outside. So we're away from one another. When we're working seasonal jobs, um, we're often working at the same place, but we aren't necessarily working right next to one another. So that's healthy. Um, and I think one thing that we've learned in the work that we do with um, the blogging and photography and video production work that we've, we've done so far is just that he's got skills and I've got skills. And we try to draw upon each other's strengths and kind of help each other through, you know, the challenges that they have. And so we're, it's a constant negotiation um, to some degree. So I hope that answers that question, um, but patience is key. And if this is the Amy I'm thinking it might be based on those questions, mm -hmm. she has a lot of patience. <laughs> she understands mm -hmm. that. Um, but I do know a lot of Amy, so maybe that isn't that Amy. That Amy. favorite thing to <laughs> favorite thing to cook on a campfire. What's that? It was Amy Amy Cole Hallway. Yes, I thought it might be that Amy actually. So just for some reason, based on that question. So um, favorite thing to cook on a campfire. Well, we love to challenge ourselves. I think a lot of people make the assumption that we eat um, simply, and we don't because we're foodies. We're also vegetarians and love to just bust out and figure out what we can make. Um, oh my gosh, we've done everything from Dutch oven lasagna to German chocolate cakes. We, we just learned a couple weeks ago you know, how everybody's been at home baking and trying new things. Well, we decided to try that as well. And we have um, this thing called a, a Banks Fry Bake, uh, similar to a Dutch oven, but it's aluminum and it's smaller. But anyway, we learned how to make focaccia from scratch, um, like the real Italian way. And it was fantastic. Um, what else have we made? And by uh, the way, if you're not following Freedom in a Can on Instagram, they have amazing photos of all of this, you know, incredible cooking and what you, you guys are very talented and it's amazing <laughs> to see what you can do in such a small space. Oh, thanks. Yeah. It's just a matter of saying, well, we like to eat that. Well, let's just figure out how to make it. So, um, yeah, just cookies, cakes, brownies, oh gosh, anything you can bake at home, we can pretty much bake on a campfire or on a two burner stove with our Banks Fry Bake pan on our, in our camper, so. Um, I would, yeah. After, when we finish this, I'll add the link to your, um, vit, what is it, your open house. And, uh -huh. Because yeah, I watched that today and that was a great example of the things that y'all cook. I was like, my gosh, y'all cook better than I do in my room. <laughs> my kitchen has everything right uh, well it's funny is we have a small kitchen but we have the things we need you know we just have one of everything we need and some things serve multiple purposes so it works out but yeah, yeah we'd love to have fun with it and yeah. i'd love to eat dinner with you sometime <laughs> i would love to have you for dinner and when we can when we can see each other in person again someday <laughs> yes I'll, i will hold you to it so we um let's see Emily, I think it's Mashair, uh, said, she said, I love your desire to continue growing and learning, um, something I've always admired about you. Huh. She asks, what's something you've learned lately or want to learn next? She said, also, hi, this is Emily Brown. Oh, Emily Brown, fantastic. Hello, Emily, I haven't seen you in a while. Um, cool, so good to have old friends <laughs> watching tonight. Something that I've learned recently or want to learn? Um, well, well, there's a couple of things. Actually, there's so many things, but it was running through my head is, so I have uh, some decent photography skills and I, I'm aware of the fact that I have a good eye and all of that, but I am not a real technical photographer. And I would love to learn some more technical skills with my camera. I know a little bit, but not a whole lot. And part of it's because I can just take a pretty picture and not use all the technicalities of it, but I would love to learn that aspect of things. Um, another thing that both my husband and I have really enjoyed doing recently is, you know, we've both become environmental educators and naturalists. And um, there's a bird singing in the background. So this is ab absolutely perfect for me to say this at this exact moment. But we just downloaded um, 
a birding course. Um, we are out in the natural environment so much and we're seeing so many different birds migrating through. And um, there's a course that was offered, I think it was through the Audubon Society. And um, we decided to go ahead and download that course so that we could get better at birding. So, cause there's a, there's a lot to know. So that's, that's just a couple things that come to mind immediately. But yeah, we're always, always learning new things when we're doing the writing work that we're doing. We're constantly doing research in order to um, write the blogs in a way that is useful to people and provide, you know, the resources and links and things like that. So we're, it's a daily process to learn something new. Yeah, it sounds like y'all are learning all the time. And I certainly have enjoyed your photography and oh, your freedom in the can and following that, um, which leads perfectly to the next question. Let's see, Z Wood was asking with so many cool things to do in all of the incredible places you visit, how do you work in downtime? <laughs> um, well, I mean, to us, well, I don't know what you consider downtime, but to us being out and just going for a walk or being in a beautiful place, um, you know, that's downtime for us. Um, you know, we have time to read at night or watch a movie at night or something like that. That's, that's downtime for us as well. But I think that's also something to keep in mind is we're not constantly driving. I think that is a misnomer. When you live mobily, the people think that you're constantly on the move. There are times, you know, just like the last month, you know, we spent the entire month in two different spots. There's, there's a limit. You can stay for three weeks in one spot in that area. And, uh, and then we moved over to another spot that was really close by. And so, um, yeah, we're not constantly moving around. And then if we're working somewhere for a season, it might be a couple months at a time. Um, or we make the decision and we don't move fast. We actually move extraordinarily slowly. We stay off the interstates almost entirely unless we absolutely have to be there to get from one point to another. Um, and oftentimes we'll figure out back roads. So um, we'll move really slowly. We don't, you know, it, if we drive more than two or three hours in a day, that's a big thing. Like we don't, we don't really drive more than two or three hours in a day. We take our time because when you're on the back roads, you're exploring small towns and villages and you know everything that goes along with it and national forests and i mean we're just we're finding things in north carolina in the last couple of months that we didn't even know existed and we lived here for a really long time so it just is slowing your life down and opening up your curiosity and um yeah and just allowing and then resting saying that's enough for the day and it's time to go to bed i've slept better in this little i call it my sleep machine um, than I have probably most of my adult life. So maybe not the last two weeks so much or three weeks so much. I've had a lot of worry on my mind about this whole world pandemic. Not so much for myself. I'm not really worried about myself. I'm worried for the world. So, and those sorts of things wake me up. But in general, um, since we've been living and traveling in Hamlet, been sleeping really well, getting plenty of downtime. Yeah, well, that makes sense that you're, you're doing the things that you're passionate about. Right, exactly. And we have the time and our life is so fluid and, and we don't make reservations and run from one place to another. That's too much work. I hate doing that. I mean, occasionally we have to make like a reservation somewhere, but it's very unusual for us to make, you know, any sort of string of reservations. If we love someplace, we stick around there. If we don't like it and the weather's lousy and it's too crowded, we move on. It's that easy. Well, that leads well into the next question that um, Ashley, I believe it's um, Gallagher, Gallagher asked, mm -hmm. what, what park or federal land surprised you the most and why? Park or federal land surprised me the most. Oh gosh, Ashley, that's a long list. <laughs> um, I can just probably throw out a few that were a surprise. Um, the North Cascades of Washington, everybody knows Olympic and everybody knows Mount Rainier, but most people have never heard of the North Cascades National Park and it's up on um, borders Canada. And it might as well have looked, I mean, it looks like New Zealand dropped in Washington. Um, mm -hmm. It's got beautiful jagged peaks and 
turquoise waters that are all with the glacial flower that has come down from, from the mountains. And the water is just gorgeous. Uh, very difficult hiking, beautiful paddling. Um, it's mind boggling. It's just, just beautiful. And we both worked and volunteered um, in that park. Uh, let's see, uh, Death Valley. And for completely different reasons, uh, I actually grew up in California. I had never been to Death Valley until a few years back. And um, it's gorgeous. It is stunning. And I think people think it's just one big flat desert and it's not, there's nothing, there's no death about it other than the fact that if you were there in the summer, you might die if you didn't have water, but there's so much life in that place. Um, so that's extra special. And, um, you know, we've just found so many parks that we'd never heard of, like um, Great Sand Dunes. We'd never heard of Big Bend before, um, Cuyahoga National Park in uh, Iowa, or excuse me, Ohio, we'd never heard of before, uh, Biscayne and Florida. There were so many that you just come across and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that was a national park. So that's been really, really cool too. That's awesome. You, you have us all excited about <laughs> parks reopening. I know, right? Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, although I'm sure they're they're having kind of a nice reprieve right now. Yes, I think our parks are breathing, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah, so maybe this needed to happen. I hate to say that out loud, but maybe it did. So, but they're breathing well. So I have one last question for you, and then I'm going to turn it over to Andrea. Um, sure. Let's see, we have... Um, What's your next next on your bucket list? Um, the place to visit or share, and then um, oh, and and just add the from Crystal Ford Bingle. She said, "Have you ever hugged a sequoia tree? If not, <laughs> I have, and I'd say, yeah, that's that's a wonderful feeling." So yes, what? Yeah, what's on your bucket list next? Oh my goodness. Um, well, that's the thing about the bucket list is the bucket list. Certainly we keep ticking things off that list, but every single time we learn about something, we, um, or it was every single time we do something, we learn about three more things is what I meant to say. And so that bucket list just keeps getting longer and longer. So Alaska is still on the list for sure, as well as British Columbia. We've been in parts of British Columbia, but I don't feel like we've done it justice. So we feel like we could kind of combine a British Columbia, Alaska trip pretty easily. But when we say Alaska, we're not planning to go for two weeks or even two months. We're talking about going for an entire season. So getting there as soon as we possibly could and leaving when the weather is really at a point where we couldn't be there any longer. So that's, that's what we're looking for with regards to that. We also have three national parks left to visit in the lower 48. Um, we've done the rest of them. So we've done 47 of the national parks. So those three, um, are White Sands down in New Mexico. And we were ever so close last year, but due to a weird flooding situation where we were, we were fine, but like we couldn't actually get out. <laughs> it was flooded, this campground, we couldn't actually get out. There were six washes you had to, to um, get across. And we had made some plans with friends. And so we ended up having to turn away and um, go the other direction instead of going toward White Sands. And, um, in the meantime, that went from a national monument to a national park in the last year. So now we had that park to add to our list and that's in Southern New Mexico. And then the other two are islands. So we haven't made it up to Isle Royale in Lake Superior. Um, got close last year, but just kind of ran out of time. We had some se a seasonal job that was waiting for us and we had to kind of boogie across um, Canada and still saw a lot, but we just we couldn't do it justice. So we weren't gonna go. And then Dry Tortugas, which is off the coast of Florida. Um, we have not been there yet either. So those are de definitely things on the bucket list um, in terms of adventures, I guess. And um, with regards to volunteer work, um, we've spent some time in Kenya in the past and we would love to get back there if we can. Um, and just, you know, things like that. Again, I could talk about this all night. <laughs> So. Yeah, and we don't we we want to make sure we're protecting your sleep time and of course your downtime. So we won't right. keep you too much longer. But Anne, do we have one more question? Um, maybe we could just choose one more for for Sherry. Uh, let's see. Let me get down to the bottom. I think 
Um, oh, Brittany McGarry just says, you should read The Great Alone before going to Alaska. It's so good. Uh, the recommendation. And let's see. Oh, Quan Graham says, hey, Quan, usually those who are active with volunteering have certain causes that they advocate for. Do you have any causes that you advocate for, Sherry, in particular? Yeah, we're, we're just huge environmental advocates. So pretty much anything related to the environment um, is stuff that we are actively doing. And that can range anything from farming to pollution and everything in between. So just caring for and creating deep care in others for the natural environment as much as possible and living more sustainably and lessening your carbon footprint as much as you possibly can. So I would say that's where it falls. I have a lot of passions for a lot of other things, um, but that's probably a central focus. Wow. Incredible. Well, Sherry, your story is amazing, inspirational, and it's certainly one that um, inspires us to, you know, to take that jump and, and live our dream. And it's great that we can kind of vicariously do it through you tonight. So we thank you for sharing your story. Um, what is a final bit of wisdom that you could share with everyone that you feel would, you know, most impact them? Oh, goodness. Um... You know, I think just something that's maybe very salient right now is, you know, this is a very unparalleled, I refuse to use the word that everybody else is saying <laughs> these days, you know the word I'm talking about. Thank you, yeah. Unparalleled time right now. And it's absolutely tragic for some, um, I know some personal stories of that tragedy, but for others, people are finding that they have a lot of time on their hands. And if you're considering a major change in your life or even some minor changes in your life. Make use of this time. Make use of this time to figure out what your someday looks like because this, this, will, this will die down at some point, right? We all have to remain hopeful that it, that it will and some sort of normalcy to our life will return. I have to believe that in order to get through this time for me. But to really just make use of, of the time that's been gifted to you. And if that's true for you, I do realize that there are some people who are also trying to manage a full-time job at home and are trying to school children. So they're like, I don't know what time you're talking about. <laughs> okay. But if you are in the situation where, you know, maybe you had a two-hour commute, you know, to your job and suddenly you're working from home, you know, use those two hours to do something that's going to create that change. And it very well may not be buying a beat up old hunting trailer on eBay and, you know, renovating it and fix hitting the road. But I do know actually a number of people that are doing that right now. Um, we have a lot of contacts on Instagram and Facebook who uh, we see all their pictures of, of renovations and stuff. So a lot of people are just using this time to buckle down and get their escape vehicle ready right now. So, but whatever that is for you, um, it's just, it's so important to put someday on a calendar. Um, otherwise it will just pass you by and you will have wished that you would have done it. Mm -hmm. And um, I would hate that for you. So make yeah. use of that time. That's great advice. Thank you for sharing that as well. And Sherry, where can we follow you um, and where can we contact you if anyone wanted to reach out with additional questions or, you know, sure. any, for any reason to reach out? Sure, absolutely. The easiest way to find all of that is on our website. It's called freedom in a can all run together or, uh, dot com. And uh, so freedom in a can dot com. And that is the website at the bottom of that website, you will find access on the front page there, you'll find access to our Facebook page, Instagram. We do a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of educational and instructional videos, mostly about solar because we run completely on solar. So we've been doing a lot of that lately. And um, you'll also find our email address, which is freedomanacan1957 at gmail.com. So all of those things are on the front page of the website and we answer you know, messenger and direct message and email and all that regularly. 
Perfect. And we'll be sure to put that in the comments. So everyone that's watching can make sure they grab that information so you can follow along with Sherry and Hutch's adventure and also reach out with them if you have any additional questions. Although we may have to do part two of this interview because I think that we've had lots of questions and I, and I think we could continue listening to you for a long, long time, Sherry. <laughs> Well, thanks. I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to do that. It's uh, <laughs> as long as I've got some solid Wi-Fi. So it, yes. it, looks, it looks like our Wi-Fi has cooperated this evening. Yes, it has. Yeah, it has. Yeah, Andrea, I was thinking the exact same thing. We're gonna definitely want to get you back, Gary. <laughs> so we'll be connected with um, where you're traveling and and when sure. you have that solid Wi-Fi and want to yep. share that time with us again. Yeah, yes. currently most of our resources are closed, like public libraries and coffee houses and such that we use for a strong Wi-Fi connection. Um, but, until, but when things reopen and they're gonna, um, we will we will have it again. So <laughs> it'll be a lot easier. All right. Well, Sherry, thank you again. Thank you for being a guest our, for our first time on these live interviews. We appreciate that so much. And thank Absolutely. you for everyone who tuned in to watch Sherry and share her story and help us celebrate the amazing inspirational story that, that she is. Um, if you would like to be a guest on our interview, or if you'd like to share your story of how you live the dream, please feel free to reach out to the Risk Takers Dream Makers. You can do it here on Facebook. Just send us a message and we'd be glad to talk. Thank you again, everyone for joining us and have a great week. Thanks everybody, bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Anne. It's been Thanks. great fun. Thanks so much.